Did you ever try to use wireless communication in your projects? Were you sure you chose the right module for your needs? These two videos will answer the nine most important questions about wireless communications for makers. And as usual, you will get some background information. Grüezi YouTubers, here is the guy with a Swiss accent, with a new episode and fresh ideas around sensors and microcontrollers. At the end of the two videos, you will understand everything necessary about frequency, modulation, bandwidth, power, propagation and a few other aspects to take the right decision for your project. And you will learn at least two new words, time and frequency domain. I'm often asked fundamental questions like, which module should I use? What is the operating range? What is the throughput? What is the connection reliability? Can it communicate one or two way? How much energy is needed for the transmission? Which module is better? What is legal? What about security issues? One remark for the specialists. As usual, I will go with Einstein. I will shamelessly make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. Let us start with the most critical aspect of wireless, the frequency it operates on. Because wires conduct electricity, they transport signals as they are. What we feed on one side drops out on the other without significant differences, at least over short distances. Air, on the other hand, is an isolator and does not transport electricity. Fortunately, Marconi and others discovered that it carries electromagnetic waves over big distances. So the first law of wireless is, we have to transfer all our signals to a higher frequency, transport it to the receiver via space and transfer it back to the baseband. These processes are called modulation and demodulation and the transport frequency usually is called carrier frequency. If we add an antenna on both sides, we have a typical wireless system. The transmitter emits a specific power and the receiver needs a minimal signal to demodulate it. The difference between the two is called link budget. With this budget you have to pay for the losses in cables, antennas and in the space between the antennas, including obstacles. By the way, if you do it right, antennas can have gain instead of losses. Here you see the names for the different frequency ranges for carrier frequencies. The band from 300 MHz to 3 GHz, for example, is called the UHF band. But which frequency is best? The answer, unfortunately, is it depends. Let's look at the aspects it depends on. One aspect is propagation. Low frequencies penetrate objects better than high frequencies. And low frequencies bend around hills, not so higher frequencies. They behave much more like light. They need a line of sight. Higher frequencies also lose more power over distance. Here are the curves for 433, 868 MHz and 2.4 GHz. These are standard frequencies used by makers. For comparison, I added the curve for 10 MHz. On the x-axis, we see the distance and on the y-axis, the power lost in space. Let us assume we have a 433 MHz transmitter with enough power to bridge one kilometer. If the same transmitter would use 868 MHz, it would only be able to bridge a half a kilometer. And on 2.4 gigahertz, only 200 meters. Quite dramatic. On 10 megahertz, by the way, the same transmitter would be able to span a distance of 43 kilometers. Another aspect of power is shown in this diagram. If we double the power of our transmitter and the size of the needed batteries, of course, 
we gain 3 dB and only 400 meters of reach on 433 MHz. Not a lot. A good antenna would have the same effect on the range, but would not increase the needed battery capacity. Maybe you understand now why I talk a lot about antennas. So far, the lower frequencies are the winners because they consume less of our link budget. Another aspect is antenna size. Antennas are needed to transfer signals into space. The lower the frequency, the longer the antenna. A typical dipole for 30 MHz is around 5 meters long. The same antenna for 5.8 GHz is only 2.6 cm long. The aspect of available bandwidth will be covered later. In this respect, high frequencies are much better. Last, the cost. When I was young, 100 MHz was a high frequency and 1 GHz was unaffordable and only for specialists. Today, every quadcopter uses 5.8 GHz and you get the devices for a few dollars. So the cost argument disappeared completely, at least on the frequencies makers work. The last three points definitely went to the higher frequencies. With this know-how, we should be able to choose the right frequency for our application. Inside buildings and for long distances, lower frequencies. Higher frequencies for the rest. Unfortunately, we have two enemies which reduce our frequency choice considerably. Other users and the law. Other users because a particular frequency only can be used once at the same time in the same location. If a receiver hears two different signals at the same time, it cannot distinguish between them and no communication is possible. Similar to a discotheque where your channel is occupied by loud music and the conversation is nearly impossible. And as a result, laws emerged. Already at the beginning of wireless communications, the countries tried to agree on the use of frequencies to reduce interferences between radio services. Here you see a very rough plan. For example, 88 to 108 MHz is allocated to FM radio stations. Some of these allocations also differ in the different regions. Governments administer most of this range. This means you have to buy costly licenses to use these frequencies. And not everybody is allowed to bid for them. A few megahertz still belong to amateur radio operators. If you want to use these frequencies, you need to pass a test and get licensed. Then you can use these frequencies also with very high power up to 1500 watts. And you are allowed to build your own device. All others have to use approved, usually FCC approved equipment. An even smaller part of the spectrum is reserved for unlicensed usage. These bands are called ISM bands. Relevant for makers are the 433, the 868 or 915 MHz and the 2.4 GHz bands. The power limits are very low on these bands usually only 100 milliwatts to 1 watt. And sometimes also the time you are allowed to transmit is limited. This is to reduce interference between the many users. Hopefully one thing is clear now. Radio waves can be received by everybody in the range of the transmitter. So they are public by definition. If we want to protect our transmission, we have to encrypt the signal or use it in our cellar that the range is very limited. What else is important? Before we continue, I have to introduce these two essential words. Time domain and frequency domain. Time domain is what we see on our oscilloscopes. The x-axis show the time and the y-axis the signal level. Simple and well known. The frequency domain is slightly different. We still have the signal level on the y-axis. The time on the x-axis is replaced by the frequency. 
lower frequencies on the left and higher frequencies to the right. Each signal can be shown in the time and in the frequency domain. It is only a different display of the same signal. The frequency domain always was the world of the spectrum analyzers. And because they are expensive, this view was hidden for many users. As an example, we look at a sine wave of 1 kHz. It sounds like that. In the time domain, we see the well-known sine wave. But how can we show the frequency domain of this signal and how does it look like? Fortunately, things changed and newer oscilloscopes can also show the frequency domain. For your small talk repertoire, they use fast Fourier transformation or FFT to calculate this curve. In the frequency domain, the sine wave shows up as a peak at 1 kHz, as expected. Let's change now to a signal often used with microcontrollers, a square wave. The time domain changes and represents a square wave. The frequency domain looks completely different. We get a lot of new peaks at 3, 5, 7 kHz and more. These peaks are called harmonics. We see a square wave occupies a much broader frequency spectrum than a sine and therefore has a much wider bandwidth. Similarly, a triangle signal. The worst are pulses. They cover an extremely broad spectrum. As you know, most of our signals are pulses. How can we load these signals on the carrier frequency? These and many other questions are answered in the second part of this tutorial. Summarized, to transmit signals in space, we have to modulate them on high frequency carriers. The frequency used by the carriers dictates the properties of the connection. Low frequencies penetrate obstacles and bend around hills. Higher frequencies behave more like light. And higher frequencies lose much more power over distance. The antenna size heavily depends on the carrier frequency chosen. We started to understand signals and their bandwidth. This is very important when we try to find the right devices. In the second part we will look at the different modulation principles and its properties. And we will see the influence of carrier frequency on available bandwidth. We will also look at ways to increase reliability of wireless communication channels. At the end we will compare two well-known modules, a NRF24L01 on 2.4 GHz and a RFM69 on 868 MHz. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. You find the links in the description. Thank you. Bye.